Yeah, ready? Yeah. Okay, we are live now. So um, I would like to thank everyone for joining in this early in the morning. And it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Greg Engel all the way from Chicago uh, giving us uh, uh, a two part tutorial on um, excited state coherences and 2D electronic spectroscopy. So Greg, welcome um, to the session of the joint uh, IISC TIFR Chemical Sciences uh, uh, webinar series. Um, so uh, just before we start and formally introduce Greg, I just wanted to remind everybody why we are here. So um, this is something that Satish and uh, Professor Satish Patel and I decided to do uh, as we are going uh, so much into um, sort of reading papers from different communities and different fields, it becomes almost hard to uh, you know, grasp the fundamentals uh, so that all of us, like the PIs, independent PIs, as well as the students, um, they find it hard to go through so much of literature. Um, and it's always good to hear from the relevant experts in the community, in the field, uh, to break that problem down or break few problems down that are really challenging and, and, and start from the fundamentals to explain why this problem is so interesting, so exciting. Um, Professor Greg Engel uh, has kindly uh, accepted our invitation and he's going to break down a problem which is very, very interesting with probably nature uses, um, you know, uses coherences, quantum coherences to uh, probably do its some of the most efficient jobs, transfer energy, do um, you know photochemistry and so on and so forth. Um, and um, it, there is no question that uh, uh, these series have been helpful to us, um, uh, both the student community in India, as well as the PIs in India, across in different institutes. And uh, we thank all the speakers uh, for making their time. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that ACS has contributed a huge lot in this direction, in these series. Um, because of uh, the generous support from ACS, we've been able to use the Zoom licenses. And um, uh, I would like to give a shout out to Diksha Gupta, ACS India, and Ajay Jha for making these things possible. And with that, I would like to hand over to my partner in crime, Professor Satish Patel from Indian Institute of Science, to formally introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Greg. Okay. Satish? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, JD. Uh, so let me begin uh, welcoming you all for this ISC. TIFR webinar series. So in, indeed, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Greg Angle. Uh, he obtained his bachelor degree from Princeton University uh, in 1999, and his PhD is from Harvard University in 2004 under the guidance of Professor Jim Anderson. He then worked with Graham Fleming at UC Berkeley as a Miller Postdoctoral Fellow and currently he's a professor in the chemistry department at James uh, Frank Institute and the Institute of Biophysical Dynamics. Of course, his research has been recognized with many, many awards. Uh, I'm going to read a few. Uh, Koblenz Award, Sloan Fellowship, Searle Scholar Award, Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering, and many, many more. In addition, his teaching has been recognized uh, with the Quantrill Award of Undergraduate Teaching and the Kamali uh, Teacher Scholar Award. Currently, Greg's group at uh, Chicago uh, is focused uh, on new strategies to observe, measure, and control the excited state uh, reactivity. They design their own uh, spectrometers to explore the bio-inspired design principles for steering excitonic transfer transport, open quantum dynamics, and photochemical reaction and dynamics. The group's scientific approach involves parallel efforts in theory, spectroscopy, biophysics, and synthesis. With this brief introduction, I invite Greg to begin his lecture. Th thank you, folks, very much. I appreciate it. Uh, the opportunity to speak to you uh, in the two lectures actually is going to be great fun. Uh, I'm going to try in my first talk to introduce you to the problem and the motivations and not teach it so much like a class, but try to show you how and what we do so you can understand the spectroscopy and the instrumentation alongside the problem. And the two evolve hand in hand, that we build the instruments to answer questions. And then these questions feed back into how we approach our science. So I hope you'll get that sense as we walk through. 
And my goal today will be to keep this accessible to a general chemistry audience, but bring you all the way up to the cutting edge by the end of the talk. And then tomorrow we'll do a deeper dive into some of the uh, more recent results that we've gotten and some exciting new things we've learned really just in the past couple months. Uh, so I'll put in a few unpublished results into that as well tomorrow. Um, so I hope you enjoy this and please feel free to ask questions. I think you can send questions to the chat uh, to uh, Satish or Jatishman. If they're questions, you know, they can interrupt and we can, we can certainly address them as we go. And that's probably the best way to make sure that uh, I'm clear because I, I'm here to help and try to teach this. So please do ask. And with that, uh, let me bring up my slides and hopefully uh, you, can, you can see these. Yes. Uh, I unfortunately can no longer see you. Um, so I will rely on uh, Satish and Jadishman to interrupt yes. if there, there's sure. an issue just because the way Zoom works. Sure. Um, so I wanna talk about how we extract excited state dynamics from two dimensional electronic spectra. And before we get into the spectroscopy or even the dynamics, I just wanna start with the motivation. And that is as chemists, we want to think about how to capture energy from light and make it do what we want it to do. We, we, we want to go out and think about how you grab that photon and hold on to the energy. Now, the technique shown here obviously doesn't work, um, but the idea I think is clear. We want to take an excited state and understand strategies to force it to react or move the way we want it to move. And that's the goal. And this is not a new idea. In fact, you know, I think for any good story, it's always worth starting at the beginning and really thinking about how this came about in the first place. And so I'm going to take a big step back uh, and just start the story at the very beginning. So think of the history of the world as a calendar. Think of you know, January 1st as when the earth is formed. And today, right now, would be the stroke of midnight on December 31st. And what I wanna do here is give you a perspective of how old photosynthesis is and to give you a perspective on how evolved this process has been over Greg, geologic sorry. time. Greg, I'm interrupting you, I'm sorry. Uh, there is a bar that has come across your slides. That's because, yes, that is because of the Zoom. I guess if there is something on the Zoom hanging up on top of on your slides. Ah, okay. Um, uh, and now there's a box. Okay, so now you've moved it. Yes. Huh. Um, okay. Uh, let me see how to hide that. Um, there we go. Is that uh, better? That's better, but now the bar is in between July and August. Oh, no, it's gone. Yeah. Okay. It's gone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, thank you. I appreciate that. And let me know if something like that happens. Please jump in. Okay. Thank sure. you. Um, so hopefully now you can see the calendar. Uh, and as you probably guessed, we start on January 1st. Right now will be the stroke of midnight on December 31st. So, you know, usually when I give these talks in person, I like to quiz people. Maybe that's not appropriate over Zoom, but I like to ask scientists, when did life begin? How, how long did it take? And, you know, that's, we see in the fossil record, the first signs of life by late February on this calendar uh, approach to the, of the age of the earth. And then the next major event is when we see oxidative photosynthesis, when we begin to see climate change driven by ozone and by oxygen, which oxidizes the entire globe. I mean, it's, it's an amazing change. So photosynthesis started sometime before this. So at least six months ago on this geologic time. And then for perspective, you, know, you should think about the biology that you know. So eukaryotic cells will be early August. Algae would be early October. In very late November, you see plants and vertebrates appearing at roughly the same time. The relative newcomers compared to the notion of photosynthesis. And then dinosaurs uh, around December 16th. And you begin to see hominids showing up around 3 p.m., the historic record with a minute and a half to midnight. And to try to bring this uh, home to Mumbai, the Hornby Villard project goes through with about two ticks till midnight. And the, the, this process of photosynthesis has been under evolutionary pressure for two and a half billion years, at least, uh, far longer than almost any other biology uh, that we study in a typical biology department. And the pressure is extreme. If you can grow just a little bit faster than your neighbors, 
you can take over the world and soon you'll look outside and the world will be green, which is in brief, the history of the planet. And so biology has had a lot of time to think about or at least explore how to do efficient photo photosynthetic light harvesting. And so we go to biology for inspiration. And I do this for a few reasons. One is that their strategies are really different than the way we do this as chemists. And I hope this is something uh, that people can take away from this talk and think about that there are strategies in play in biology that we just don't usually think of. So when we look at photosynthesis, one of these things is division of labor. The idea that you don't use the same material to absorb the light as you do to split the electron in the hole. So when we create photovoltaics, we create perfect single crystal materials to get the highest possible efficiency. Photosynthesis, first, doesn't have that luxury, but second, has found a way to be extremely uh, efficient, at least through quantum efficiency, by using different materials to absorb in the light harvesting complex and the antenna complex as arrays of chlorophylls there, which are completely separate from the chlorophylls that actually do the charge separation inside the reaction center. So this sort of division of labor is something that I find really fascinating because a lot of the uh, electrical engineering of pixels and light and detectors has to do with their junction capacitance and the nature of using the same material for the charge separation as for the absorption. So I, I find this really fascinating. The other element of this that I find fascinating is the use of this chlorophyll or bacteria chlorophyll. And I should note just for reference, this is from a middle school textbook, a rather advanced middle school textbook. Um, but we're gonna look at that little orange arrow that you see down at the bottom. That little orange arrow there is going to be the, the light harvesting in the antenna. And that's the kind of part that we're going to look at, just that little piece before the biochemistry. But I wanna get back to this bacteria chlorophyll. This bacteria chlorophyll and chlorophyll, two related pigments, these are the backbone of almost all photosynthesis across the globe. And as chemists, this is a little surprising because when we make a molecule for light harvesting or energy transfer or charge separation or electron transfer, or we think about quenching or making switches to control this, we make a new molecule for every single application. This is what keeps us gainfully employed as chemists. Whereas biology has taken a completely different approach, a much more engineering focused approach, where you use the same molecule over and over and over again, but in different configurations, different distances, different alignments, different couplings between these molecules and using groups of these molecules cooperatively to do the light harvesting. If they need to shift the spectrum, you create a J or an H aggregate. If you need to do charge separation, you create a very strongly coupled special pair. And this I find fascinating because it tells us action here is not in the molecule itself. It's not chemistry in the view of a synthetic chemist. It's instead in the couplings between the molecules that drive the absorption spectrum, the properties, the energy transfer, and the charge separation. And so one major theme of this talk is going to be how to measure and understand the coupling, and then also how to understand the dynamics. And so we need to create spectroscopies that are going to give us access to those properties. How are the molecules coupled to one another? How can we measure that? What are the dynamics for the energy transfer? How and why does it move? And I wanna give you a sense of how we go in and look at this. And so there are a lot of questions, not just how does the energy move, which is biophysics, but why? What's the fundamental reason is there a way that we can think about getting efficient transfer for, through wet, disordered materials and still have it be robust and reliable? And that's what biology does. Are there strategies that we don't use today? Are there different ways to think about this problem? And boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could just see what's going on? And these are our motivators. These are the things that we think about when we go into the laboratory. And you know, the first thing, of course, is you have to grow these samples. This is a student uh, from many years ago in my group who set up this photosynthetic light harvesting uh, box, so I wanted to give him some credit, uh, growing some uh, rhodobacter spheroides uh, in the lab, some purple bacteria. And in this particular discussion, I'm gonna actually pivot to a different bacterium, uh, the green sulfur bacteria, Chlorobaculum tepidum. 
And this is one of those ancient ones from two and a half billion years ago. If you think about photosynthesis, this is like the Model T. This is one of those first early photosynthetic organisms. It's not the Ferrari that is the tree or plant that you see outside. It's just a, a simple one that's been relegated to some of the you know, worst environments in the world. It lives on the bottom of these microbial mats under an inch of sludge, getting one photon per reaction center per half hour, but it never drops its photon. So it's a tough life. It's energy starved all the time. It has a doubling time of about 22 years, which is roughly like our doubling time, you know, not what you usually think about for bacteria. And it, when it absorbs a photon, it splits it with 100% efficiency under ideal conditions. And that's just amazing. So it's a great place to look for how these, material, how these systems would work. And that's why we study this one. It's also theoretically tractable, which makes it really easy to handle. This is an electron micrograph uh, from Niels Frigard looking at these uh, prokaryotic cells. And I tell you it's a prokaryotic cell, but if you look at the edges, you see these white bodies, which are, are going to be the light harvesting antennae for this system. And these are basically liquid crystals of bacterial chlorophyll, hundreds of thousands of bacterial chlorophyll. And that's where the light is absorbed. That's one of the ways that they're so efficient. They use these crystalline materials there but then they transfer the energy that's absorbed to a reaction center that's sitting in the membrane. And you can almost see the little gaps between these chlorosomes and the membrane. And that's where the complex that we're most interested in sits. It's just that little connector, that little wire that connects the antenna to the reaction center and transmits that energy with high efficiency. And this complex that links these chlorosomes here is called the Fenna Matthews Olson complex, the FMO complex. And it just sits as a little spacer between the chlorosome and the reaction center. Uh, and that's the one we're going to look at. It's nice, it's simple, it's sparingly water soluble because it's not an integral membrane protein. And it, so it's easy enough that a physical chemist can handle it. It's quite robust. And it only has about eight chlorophylls per subunit. And that makes it very tractable theoretically to understand what's happening. It also, for the spectroscopists in the audience, it's asymmetric. So it doesn't have dark states. And that's also very handy when your only tool to probe something is a laser. This is what it looks like. It's kind of like a taco shell that holds these bacteria chlorophylls. Shown here are the seven chlorophylls that are in the middle. There is an eighth one, but it tends to come off if you don't handle it terribly well. And you know, this is the chlorophyll. So from the point of view of a spectroscopist, I can see this. I can see these chlorophylls. But the chlorophyll isn't the part that's evolved. And this sets up a very nasty inverse problem because it's actually the protein in the environment that's evolved and that we're most interested in. And yet the part that I can see are these green chlorophylls. And even more specifically, I can just see the chlorine rings where the transition dipoles are on these different chlorophyll molecules. And so I'm stuck looking at these transitions, these seven different transitions, eight if we use the right surfactants, and I have to understand how and why the energy moves in order to get at the underlying design principles. And this is something that is both exciting and frustrating because we know where the action is at, we know it's in the evolved system, but what we can see are these bright states. On the other hand, it is photosynthesis. So the bright states are the functional states in this system. It's not like a fluorescent tag that you add. These are intrinsic chromophores that are absolutely necessary for the function. So we do have that going for us. But I want you to kind of keep in mind throughout the talk that one of the questions is going to be, what does the bath do? What does the protein do? What are the vibrations of these chlorophylls do? What are all the other chemical things that we can't see with our electronic spectroscopy in the visible regime? And how do they impact the dynamics that we care about? And that's gonna be one of the themes that you hear me coming back to throughout this talk. How do we see that? How do we sense that? How do we tell what's going on with these other types of motions that we're somewhat blind to? And is there a way to tell what's important? Is there a way to probe those bath couplings? Now, when you're fa faced with a number of chromophores that are coupled, you do what any self-respecting physicist would do. You diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And when you diagonalize the Hamiltonian, you find the low energy state that's right by the reaction center. That's the red one. And up uh, on the top near the purple and the blue, you see where it would link to the chlorosome. And in fact, when we did this the first time, uh, we just did it because that's what you do for a Hamiltonian. 
Uh, the biologists thought this was deeply insightful and they subsequently realized that this is in fact the orientation in which it sits uh, inside the organism. They, they had no idea before. Um, so I, I found that kind of interesting that these, com these discussions between fields can be really fruitful, even for the things that a physicist might take for granted. Uh, a you know, biologist might you know, look at that and derive some very insightful uh, ideas. So this has been a very productive collaboration in that regard. Greg, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so on, on, on the reaction center, as well as the light harvesting of, and then the FMO, uh, there is this connection of the protein base plate. So um, uh, do these actually sort of just act like a linker or they have also other uh, chromophores associated with it? There are chromophores inside the base plate. Uh, the base plate remains a little bit of a mystery because it's not been well isolated or understood. We know some of the proteins that go into it, but we don't have a good sense of structure. In comparison, there are now wonderful NMR structures of the chlorosome itself, those rods of aggregated bacteria, chlorophyll C. So the base plate does have chromophores in it. We know they're chromophores embedded. They're bacteria chlorophyll. Um, I believe they're bacteria chlorophyll A, okay. but, they, but we don't know enough about it. There have been some studies, but there's not a good structure. Okay, thank you, Greg. In contrast, the crystal structure I'm showing you is known to about uh, 1.2 angstroms. Yes. Uh, so it's a really well-resolved crystal structure. Yes. And that is necessary in order to understand the relationships between the chromophores. So we're a little bit limited uh, in what we can look at definitively by what our crystallographic colleagues can resolve. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. The base plate is an interesting thing though. Uh, and so, I just wanted to put on top of this some of the arrows derived by Tobias Brixner with Graham Fleming uh, in 2004, 2005 uh, in their Nature paper, just so you can kind of see how the energy flows. And I'll actually show you the spectra and how they extracted this information in a few minutes. Uh, but I want to kind of give you a sense of how the energy moves. There are a couple of different pathways, the white and the brown that were positive uh, at that time, but all the energy flows to that lowest energy X ton before going to the reaction center. Now, I also want to step back and talk a little about this coupling idea and how to think about it. And one of the things you'll find throughout this talk as we extend our ideas from the spectroscopy towards molecular insight is it depends often on your frame of reference. Now, this should not be a surprise to most chemists that we always have to think carefully in order to make sense of what's going on at the molecular scale. For the people who like statistical uh, mechanics, you have to define carefully your system versus your bath. And that can make an easy problem hard, or in some cases, if you're lucky, a hard problem easy. And for organic chemists, we think about solvation shells. We think about the role of the solvent. Sometimes it's a spectator, sometimes it's active. Sometimes we really need to think about the structure in detail, uh, especially for uh, certain stereochemistry. And here it's no different. There are a couple of ways to think about these seven different chromophores. We can think about, the electrostatic environment around each chlorophyll. And we can think about how each chlorophyll is coupled to its neighbors. This would be the site basis. And, you know, as a, if you look at the structure, can I, I find can this- that, uh, yeah. you know, These chlorophyll molecules, they are all not exactly identical, right? There are small variations in the- structure. No, they are all exactly identical. They are all bacteria chlorophyll A. They, okay. they are occasionally when they pack in the protein, they pack into different uh, configurations in some sense, that some of the side chains might wrap around each other, they may intertwine, but the molecules, if I extract them with an ether extraction and put them in an NMR, they are absolutely identical. So that when they're in so basic, basically the pi electron cloud is very same type of distribution or something like that? Or yeah, or yeah, so the, it's, exactly. So they are sensitive, of course, to their elect electrostatic and indeed electrodynamic environment, because of these pi electron clouds, mm -hmm. they have about you know, 24 delocalized bonds. Right, yes. um, you know, ballpark, it's a little different for chlorophyll and bacterial chlorophyll, but in the 20s, 22, 24 uh, delocalized electrons in that pi system. And so they are sensitive to their environment, but I think by any chemical definition, these molecules are all identical. Okay. They're so simply in different electrostatic environments and in some cases, different spatial configurations because there's some secondary structure to the phytal chain, which I'm not showing in detail on these. I'm just trying to focus on that chlorine ring 
because otherwise there's a lot of spaghetti that stops you from being able to count that there's seven different chromophores there. So what and from the point of view of my laser, kingdom. I only see the seven transition dipoles mm -hmm. uh, in the QI transitions. So, you know, if we look at the basis set that I can access with my laser, it really looks like seven different transitions, seven two level systems, if you will. Okay. And that's the Hamiltonian that we work with when we think about it. But as a chemist, we have to be aware that there's a lot more going. And so one of these bases is coupling those transition dipoles to one another. And it's very simple. It's dipole dipole coupling, uh, simple electrostatics. The other basis, which I prefer quite strongly is the excitonic basis. And this is looking at the eigenvalues of that Hamiltonian, where you get delocalized states that extend across multiple chromophores because of the coupling. And these are the transitions, the time independent states that we can probe with our laser. That's why I like that basis set. It's because I'm biased by the fact that I'm a spectroscopist who owns a laser. So when I probe things, I probe energy levels. I, I can't probe individual molecules. I can only probe the transitions that I can see with my laser. And the excitonic basis set is the right one to think about there. But it immediately begs the question, if you have a weak coupling and there's some noise, should I think of these molecules as coupled or should I think of them as separate? And you can immediately see that there's an intermediate regime where a lot of this becomes murky. And it turns out that that intermediate regime is actually the regime in which photosynthesis operates. And so the excitonic basis just has this delocalization. In FMO, they're often pairwise delocalized. In other complex, they can have 27 uh, chromophores that are coupled. Uh, and so, you know, in some cases, it's large delocalization. In FMO, it's relatively simple. Again, making this complex kind of a darling of the physical chemistry uh, world. It's the one where we know the most about energy transfer, and yet in some sense, it's almost the least important photosynthetic complex you'll come by, but it teaches us a lot. And so, as an experimentalist, our job is measuring these couplings. How do we measure chromophores that are coupled to one another? And how do we do it using light, which can only see those excitonic delocalized states? And the way that we approach this is we have to use multiple interactions so we can create one excitation and see how it changes a different excitation sometime later. And this immediately tells you that you need a nonlinear spectroscopy with multiple interactions with the system. Just because of the symmetries, the simplest one of these is going to be a third order nonlinear spectroscopy. So you have linear absorption and then in an isotropic medium, the next one that you can access is a third order spectroscopy. And it also tells you you're gonna need ultra fast pulses because you need strong enough fields to create a macroscopic response that you can sense. Um, otherwise you're up against noise floor all the time. And it turns out the time scale of the dynamics in these complexes is sub picosecond in general. So you need very fast interactions and you need to be able to tell where the energy went in and where the energy comes out. That is, you're gonna need multiple dimensions. Now for any chemist, you already know the answer to this. The answer to this is simple. When you have dipole-dipole couplings and you need two dimensions, you go straight to your NMR. You go to cozy or nosy spectroscopy, you use a glorified spin echo, and that teaches you everything you need to know about these coupled transitions. Now, there are big differences looking at electronic transitions from looking at spins in an NMR and say a cozy spectrum. And what we do, though it's dipole-dipole coupling, this pulse sequence is similar to cozy. So one difference is in an NMR, you need some enormously big magnet to create tiny, tiny splittings between otherwise degenerate states. In electronic spectroscopy, you don't need that. You have a ground and an excited state. They are different and you don't need any magnet. So, so that's good. At least you can get started. The downside is you do need really carefully crafted pulses. And while that might be easy in the radio regime, we've been good at that for a century. Doing this in the optical regime is somewhat harder. In particular, you can't create them with arbitrary phase. And because of that, you need phase stabilization. And remember, these wavelengths are only about a micron long, 800 nanometers long. So your entire instrument has to be really stable to well below 800 nanometers. And that sets up the first experimental challenge. And I'll show you how we handle some of these things uh, down the road. Now, when you think about this, you, there are many ways to approach it. One is really go back to your NMR and think about cozy spectra. 
If you're an organic chemist and you're comfortable with that, that's fine. Let me offer a couple of other ways to think about it. So much like the runners on a track that you're used to for uh, a Han Echo, you can think about this in a slightly more optics relevant uh, analogy as using the first pulse to create a coherence between a ground and excited state. And what that does is it evolves phase at an optical frequency. Effectively, the phases spread due to inhomogeneity. Then you stop that evolution and you create an excited state population, for example. And that sits and evolves for some period of time T, capital T. That allows you to watch the dynamics in the system. And then you have it rephased to create an echo. And you can learn a lot about the system from that signal that comes out. And what's beautiful about this is just like an NMR, you can take a Fourier transform over the time difference between those first two pulses. And then you can resolve the color of the final pulse and create a two-dimensional map. And so you can think about this as rays spreading out with a lens and then collimating and then focusing again to give you an echo. You can think about it as runners on the track running away, turning around and running back. And if they have a memory of their initial speed, they all come back to the starting line at the same moment. Yeah, if you're a fan of uh, Shaul Mukamel's book on principles of nonlinear spectroscopy, you can propagate the Green's functions. Um, or if you're an experimentalist, you can think about two pulses to excite the system, to pump it, and then two pulses, a uh, emitted pulse and a stimulated pulse to probe it. So you can think of this like pump probe where you spectrally resolve the pump and you spectrally resolve the probe. And these are different ways to think about the two-dimensional spectra. They're all equivalent. And when you read these spectra, there's a lot of information in them. The x-axis on all my plots will be the energy in. The y-axis will be the energy out at some period of time later. And these techniques were developed kind of simultaneously uh, by David Jonas's group, Dwayne Miller's group, and uh, Graham Fleming's group. And so you can go back and read these papers by Hibble and Cowan and Brixner if you really wanna get into the detail. But the basic idea is you hit the complex with three strong non, uh, ultra fast pulses and it emits a photon echo in a unique direction. Um, this is actually one of the beautiful things about optics. There's enough linear momentum in these photons that you can separate the directions of the emitted signals. And that signal that comes out in a unique direction, all you have to do is detect it and disperse it in a phase sensitive detector. And suddenly you can transform over one dimension to get your x-axis and you can tell what frequency was absorbed. And you can look at your y-axis and tell what frequency was emitted. And then if you see something on the main diagonal, a little boring, nothing happened. It, it was, the energy was emitted at the same frequency at which it was absorbed. If you see a peak below the main diagonal, that means you put energy in at higher energy and it relaxed down to lower energy before it was emitted. So you saw energy transfer. And you can ask yourself, how fast does this happen? Between which states does it happen? And is there anything more complex going on? And these are the types of things that we like to address with these spectra. And when we do it, we have to do the perturbation theory very carefully. So as I've explained it to you now, uh, you can think about being in an excited state during that middle time. And so I've shown you a Feynman diagram here from Shaul Mukamel's book that is on the main diagonal. And basically it's simple. It says your first interaction puts one side into an excited state. You then put the whole system into excited state. You wait a while to see what happens. And then it turns out nothing happens and you get signal back out of that same excited state where you put the energy in. And so this is on the main diagonal. It's a little bit boring, but it's one of the signals. Now it gets complex because anytime you do this third order perturbation theory for a third order nonlinear spectroscopy, you have to take into account every single one of these diagrams. You can't have some without the others. And so you get pathways that go through the ground state. This would be called the ground state bleach. Basically looking if two different transitions might share a common ground state. And then you get the fun ones. You get the energy transfer pathways. The ones where you put energy into one state and you find it somewhere else a little while later. These are the ones that you really want to look at. These are the ones that teach you something. And they're also the ones that evolve in time. And so this is very useful because these are the ones that change or change most readily. And so you can usually find and isolate these pathways and learn something from them. And this is our first approach where, you know, if I fulfill the promise of my title, you can begin to extract excited state dynamics from 2D spectroscopy. Now, of course, as I mentioned, you have all the other pathways. You get uh, 
ground state bleach pathways off of the main diagonal, and you get some pretty wild non-rephasing pathways that uh, are a little tougher to keep track of. Um, and you have to think about all of these when you interpret the spectra. But by and large, you're going to get a nice absorptive spectra that contains a lot of information. So if you didn't like the uh, perturbation theory in the last couple of slides, here's a simple tutorial on how to read these spectra. Energy in is on the x-axis. Energy out is on the y-axis. And so a peak that is homogeneously broadened, where the dynamics mix everything up, will look perfectly round. A peak that maintains memory of where you initially excited it, that is, maybe some of those chlorophyll molecules are a little red of average. Maybe some are a little bit blue. Given enough time, they'll exchange. But if you look at the bottom left peak here, the one sitting right around here, that's inhomogeneously broadened. It's elongated along the diagonal. And you can watch the memory. Those elongated peaks with, you know, over the course of a picosecond or two will round out. And then you'll see cross peaks. You can see positively correlated motion where you have energy transfer between two. You can see negatively correlated where say the red edge of one side might be coupled to the blue edge of the other and you get these really unusual shapes tilted kind of the wrong way. You also see excited state absorption. I didn't show you these pathways, but there's nothing to say that you can't absorb a second photon. And you tend to see those above the main diagonal inside these uh, complexes. So what Tobias Brixner did in this initial study, it's a really groundbreaking study on FMO in 2005, is he looked at the 2D spectra. These are the first 2D spectra of a photosynthetic complex. And he looked at the rate of growth of these different peaks. And you can kind of see as he mapped to the seven different excitons as best he could to these spectra. And you know, things have gotten better and more sensitive uh, since then. But this was the first one that sort of oriented us inside this complex. And what it taught us was where the energy moved and between which states the energy moved most readily inside the complex. But as a chemist, rather than a biophysicist, I don't just want to know what the energy does. I want to know why. I want to know how to control it. And this required a whole new battery of experiments that I'm going to tell you about. You know, so if we go back to this picture, we know the pathways. We want to know why. And in a diagonalized Hamiltonian that's time independent, I mean, this is kind of like the only thing in quantum mechanics that's boring. It's precisely where nothing happens. I mean, it, it, it is the definition of boring in as much as nothing ever changes. In order to make something happen, you need a perturbation. You need a, a little jostling from the bath. You need something to change in order to make the dynamics uh, occur. And of course, that's assuming you really diagonalize the entire universe, which never quite happens, but it's a pretty decent approximation. So we want to understand the system bath couplings that can drive energy transfer. And the first question when I talk to biologists is, what do you mean there's their femtosecond motions inside a protein? Nothing in a protein moves that fast. The rotation, by the way, is just for your visualization. The protein doesn't really do that. But you can see all of the thermal motions. This is a 300 Kelvin MD simulation uh, shown in various ways. So you can see motions of the chromophores, motions of the side chains. You know, from the point of view of a laser, you might just see those transitions in the chromophores and you can immediately see why they're broadened. You can see that there'll be memory effects and that there are finite time scales associated with all of these. And this is what we're up against in just a picosecond. And a picosecond is roughly the right amount of time for energy transfer inside this complex. So these are the motions we're trying to think about. These are the thermal motions that happen. There are also, of course, non-thermal motions, which we should be very careful about, because once we absorb a photon, we're necessarily out of equilibrium. And so non-equilibrium effects are also very important and very interesting in these complexes. Now, how do we make our measurement? Well, when we have two chromophores, each presumably Hi, gets... Yes? Just to, just to ask a small question, where do these memory effects come from? Where do the memory... So there's an energetic memory effect simply because if you take a random sampling, there's going to be a finite time scale for exchange between say the red end of a spectrum and the blue. So if you take a flat molecule and it bends a little bit, okay. you know, does it take 10 femtoseconds to unbend or 100 femtoseconds to unbend? What is the time scale of that motion? And if it's a free vibration, we can actually calculate it very nicely. But if it has to do with a secondary structure or a folding of the protein, it can be a very long time. So we tend to see inhomogeneities so across could, all time scales. So that could lead to energy changes too, the bending. 
Excuse me. The bending could lead to energy changes in the chromophore. If it bends, it will lead to energy changes. Yes, any flexure of these or deflection is going to lead to energy changes. And we see in the crystal structure that some of these actually are on average slightly deflected. Uh, and this tends to do with the histidines that bind the magnesium in the center of the bacteria chlorophyll, uh, as well as the shape of the pocket. And it can cause a little bit of cupping in some of the bacteria chlorophylls. And so- You mentioned that all the- you mentioned that all the chrome force are identical, right? All they, the they're molecules. Chem, they're all, all chemically the identical, but they are all in slightly different in, environments. So the energy changes are because of the environment or because of this dynamics, the bending and so on? Both. So there are both, there are both static uh, energy changes. So we can have uh, about 800 wave numbers out of 12,500 uh, that okay. differ between the different excitons. So there is a range or sorry, between the chromophores. So if we have eight chromophores, we, their average, their mean energy will differ by up to about 800 wave numbers due to the different environments. In addition, each of these environments is dynamic. So about that mean there will be fluctuations and those fluctuations will all have finite time scales. Okay, and one more thing, you mentioned about there are two pathways by which the energy can funnel and go through. Mentioned about two pathways, right? Yeah, yes. So Tobias Brixner identified two separate pathways in his nature paper in 2005. There, that's a little bit of an oversimplification. Everything's linked to everything else, but he identified two dominant pathways. So there could be more also. There are necessarily more because the, it's not that you can yeah. only have certain transitions, but he, he identified two dominant pathways. Okay. And indeed Thank the branching you. there, uh, is you know on the order of about 70, 30 or 85, 15. These, these are two large pathways. And uh, you'll hear me talk tomorrow a little bit more about some of these and we can actually switch them now. And that's kind of neat. So you, you, we've gained a little bit of control. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I have a question here. Hi, uh, really enjoying this talk. So you talked about those femtosecond uh, scale motions or uh, thermal motions they are never coupled to your excitation because those are the random motions. So that gives rise to the question that if you have any coupling actually of the dynamics, then um, either your uh, energy dynamics is slow compared to those motions, in which case only the average matters, or they occasionally couple to one of these randomly sort of thing. How do you take care of that? Yeah, so there, there are two elements. So first of all, our dynamics tend to be fast compared to most of these motions. Um, so you're not in a situation where they're homogeneously broadened. Secondly, it's actually, in many cases, it's the non-equilibrium motions, those motions that come out of the Frank-Condon region after excitation that end up driving uh, the energy transfer. So it's not actually the thermal motions, though there is a thermal background and that does contribute, of course. But there are other elements of this that seem to be in play. And that's one of the exciting things that we're coming to learn. So your, your intuition is exactly right. There are thermal motions that are always out of sync, out of phase with our excitations. And there's a background of those. And there is a spectral density. Typically, we think of it as an ohmic or superohmic spectral density that has a peak around 100 wave numbers. Um, and these these types of motions are there. And in typical theoretical calculations, those are what couple and drive the energy transfer. We found with our experiments that there may be a little bit more going on. And I'll start to show you hints of that at the end of this talk. The other way, sorry to have a second question. The other way to ask is that if I put this system in liquid helium, uh, do things change substantially? Yeah, so it turns out interestingly, uh, that the dynamics get a little bit faster as you cool it down in most photosynthetic complexes. Um, which probably isn't the answer you expected. Uh, but uh, we see this at 77 Kelvin. Typically liquid helium doesn't make a huge amount of difference compared to liquid nitrogen because of the amount of inhomogeneity. That is, you don't anneal out to a single form. So you, you're just freezing in a snapshot uh, and it's really frozen in by the time you get to 77 Kelvin. Um, but yes, there are, you can, you can get rid of that background and you still see the dynamics. And in many cases, not the FMO complex per se, but in most photosynthetic complexes, the dynamics actually get a little bit faster at lower temperatures. Not something that's foreign to uh, say a tunneling region or certain other uh,
things that people have talked about uh, in a in inside Marcus theory. So inverse Thank effects. You. Yep, the inverted region. So yeah, there, there's a lot going on there. It's it's a it's a complex system. Let me give you a simple explanation for how we do the coupling before we get into you know all of this detail. And that is when you have two chromophores that mix and you get a local fluctuation, that is one of the moves here, the blue one, it's going to cause correlated motions between exciton one and exciton two, because there's a little bit of blue in exciton one and a lot of blue in exciton two. And that correlation shows up exactly in the correlation spectroscopy, the COSY spectroscopy that I described to you. Similarly, if you have a motion on exciton one, you'll see the same, or the chromophore two, excuse me, the red chromophore, you'll see motion in both exciton one and exciton two. And that will, that correlation will show up as well. And so all of these different motions that you were just describing actually are a tool for us to then go and look at the coupling. And it's the correlation that we care about. It's not the precise phase. Um, so in a typical 2D spectrum where you're looking at a cross peak, these are the ways that we measure coupling. Now, as I think you were intuiting with your last question, you can have some unusual things if they're locked together. So all these things move together. Chromophore one and chromophore two move synchronously as compared to randomly. Then you get a little bit different behavior um, and it locks together those two excitons. Um, and now suddenly it changes your view of the dynamics. And this is a little bit of a teaser for some of the things that we start to see in our spectroscopy. So how do we do it? How do we actually go in and look at this? Well, it turns out, everything we see in spectroscopy is always a coherence. And that's to say it's an oscillating electric field. And when we look at a coherence, we can think about how it evolves. We can use this to get relationships between states and are they perturbed by these random motions which will cause them to dephase? Do they stay in some sort of synchronous motion which might not be you know, familiar to most chemists? And we can think about coherent evolution as well as relaxation due to the environment. And it's very easy to think about solving these differential equations. You're gonna get an oscillation at the energy gap uh, frequency, the difference between the two energies. And then you're going to have an envelope that causes this to decay. And so what this means is you're going to see an observable oscillating signal, and then you're going to see a dephasing due to the environment. And in linear spectroscopy, we would call this a line shape. Uh, but in the 2D spectroscopy, we can do something kind of cool, and we can look at relationships of states to one another. And this is what's most relevant to photosynthesis. Because if you're moving from one excited state to the next, you don't care about the motion to the ground state, you care about the uh, motion relative to one another. So, you know, if I had been able to come to India, uh, I would have flown there. And in doing so, I'd be sitting in a chair moving at about 600 miles an hour. Now, jumping from one chair moving at 600 miles an hour to another chair moving at 600 miles an hour sounds really hard because they're moving really fast. But if it's the flight attendant saying, sir, would you please move across the aisle? It's really quite simple because the relationship between the two chairs on the same airplane, the, the, seats, are, the seats are stationary. It's very simple. You move across the aisle. If the two seats are on different airplanes, it's a much tougher request. So getting the relationship between the excited states as compared to their relationship with the ground state doesn't matter that they're moving at 600 miles an hour. It matters whether they're moving relative to one another. And this is the information that we get out of these coherences. So if we go back to these diagrams, instead of just looking at an excited state, you can look at a coherence between two excited states during that middle time. And then you'll see at the bottom of my slide, there's this little orange omega naught, which is a very slow energy difference looking at the gap between E and E prime. And it turns out, much to our frustration and chagrin, all of the gaps in these photosynthetic complexes match almost perfectly the vibrations of uh, the chlorophyll complexes. And this is a fact that was pointed out uh, by uh, Vivek Tuari and David Jonas, looking at Ronman spectra and trying to explain some of these uh, effects that we were seeing. And it quickly leads you to one of two possibilities. Martin Plenio suggested that wow, you know, nature has evolved to tune its excited states, energy gaps to match the vibrations. And this is one of the ways that the system can move energy. Or in the alternative, we have built the world's most expensive Raman spectrometer. Uh, that is maybe we're just looking at ground state vibrations and this isn't right. I, I will refute that later in the, in the talk with some data. 
Um, but from the spectra that you see right here, you can't actually tell the difference. And this, of course, worried us. So we figured out how to solve that question. Um, and it doesn't look like their ground state uh, coherences that we're seeing. It looks like it's much more like the lockstep spectral diffusion. Um, Greg, so, Greg, yes. Question. Quick question here because that's you're hitting the, the important part. Um, this um, the, the 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 fact that David Jonas and Vivek's measurements uh, do mention about these uh, you know these uh, vibronic stuff. But um, the the point here is that there's still ground state Raman frequencies that they match up to. Um, and um, uh, do they have any contributions from excited state? Yeah. Um, so it. It turns out that when you have a pi to pi star transition in a pi system that has about 22 delocalized electrons, the amount of yes. change you see is extremely minimal. So right. when we resolve these things to 10 or 20 wave numbers, we can't tell actually okay. uh, that way. There are ways to tell if they're on the ground or excited state by using the details of the 2D spectroscopy. Right. And there, um, it's unpublished data I'll talk about tomorrow. We can actually isolate uh, some of the excited state coherences, and we can explain a lot of what's going on. Yeah, people, um, haven't, people haven't done any excited state Raman measurements on these chlorophylls in the national systems, so that's 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 a hard thing to do uh, simply because you're you don't get enough uh, even for the chlorophylls don't get enough cross sections. So for a direct Raman measurement. Uh, no, that that's right, and the uh, the upper state lifetimes of these things. Uh, are not very long if they transfer to that exciton one within a picosecond. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so, so your ability to resolve that with say a femtosecond simulated Raman experiment right. is uh, pretty minimal. Yeah. Uh, and then of course you still have all the non-rephasing diagrams. I just throw this one in here to make, make it clear that you know, I don't wanna oversimplify. And so what do we do? The first time we saw signals like this, uh, was around uh, 2007. And we started looking on the main diagonal um, and it was kind of a crude experiment, but we saw all of these wiggles and wobbles and didn't know what to do, uh, but it was clear there was something there. And what we found through uh, a non-uniform fast Fourier transform, which was honestly kind of new math, but a little bit of a kludge because we didn't expect this to last but 70 femtoseconds. So we had to keep changing our time step to see what was going on, to see when this, signal would dephase, we ended up you know, realizing that it matched pretty well to the excitonic energy spectrum for what we would predict. Um, it at least was consistent with it because a non-uniform fast Fourier transform isn't a, uh, it isn't one-to-one -one and onto. So it's, it, there, were, there were some questions with this, but at least shows we're consistent with it. And this started a little bit of a firestorm thinking about these coherences and People ran in a lot of different directions. You know, it's, it's brilliant, it's wrong, it's, you know, right, and this must be, you know, manifestly quantum. It's, you know, the wrong explanation for a very simple effect involving vibrations. There are lots of theories on this. And this sets up an experimental challenge. How do you go back and pull it apart? Is it reproducible? And I wanna show you some of what we got out of this. Um, so we argued in that paper that this was evidence for electronic coherence and uh, wave-like energy transfer. I think our view of this was probably overly oversimplified at that uh, time, but I think we got a lot of it right. And I'll start to show you data to those uh, ends here. So if we go down into the lab, the first thing we realize is there are a lot of measurements to be made. If you're going to scan in two dimensions uh, and then add a third dimension of time to this, you have to really think carefully about how you're going to approach these scans. And my students were taking data and you know, it was taking us about 48 hours to collect the data set. And I was saying to some of these students, you know, I'd really like this to be 50 times better. And they being smart students said, okay, it's two days. And so 50 times better, I should probably do 2,500 times the signal averaging, that's 5,000 days. That's an 18 year PhD. And as you can imagine, that didn't make the students real happy. Uh, but I had a really clever postdoc, uh, now professor at Michigan State, and he realized that instead of doing what we usually do, where we control a time delay between two pulses and then change it and take more data and change it and take more data, we could use tilted pulses and take lots of points at once and get rid of all of the pulse to pulse fluctuations. So this was kind of a cool technique. We take a pulse out of our laser system, we split it into two copies as it moves down the laser table. 
And these two copies of the pulse are gonna propagate next to each other. This is going to be our primary time delay for our dynamics. And then we're gonna take each of these and create two pulses from each of those. Those are going to be our excitation and our detection pulse pairs. And now instead of controlling the time between these first, the first two and the last two pulses, we're going to use a set of flat, actually very flat mirrors to impart tilts on the pulses where the middle two are perfectly parallel. The top one is coming down, the bottom one is rising. We focus to a line inside our sample. And what is a line but a stack of points? And that stack of points is going to be all of our different time delays. And you can see here that first pulse is just for detection. But then if I pause it, you can see that there's a slight tilt between these two, that they're closer at the bottom than at the top. That sets up all of the time delays based on the speed of light vertically across our sample. It multiplexes the spectroscopy. We get our photon echo, which I show here in green, just so you can keep track of it. It's really red. And then everything else is easy. We just use imaging optics. So spherical mirrors like this, and we can separate out our detection and signal pulse from everything else. In the Fourier plane of that spherical optic, all the pulses spatially separate. We just create a slit and a piece of metal. And the same way when you tune a musical instrument, two different frequencies will beat in time. Here, two different pulses in time, ultra-fast pulses, will beat in frequency when they go into the spectrometer and they get dispersed by the grating. The actual dispersal is not shown here physically, but they spread out in time and space. And then you'll see the spectrum and the interferogram, uh, which is all taken in a single uh, laser acquisition. So this allows us to then run 300 data points at once, uh, which lets us go 300 times faster than we ever did before. And because we get rid of pulse to pulse fluctuations, we get 50 times better signal to noise. So now we can run the 18 year experiment in about 10 minutes. Uh, and this was really eye opening to be able to go and watch these femtosecond uh, measurements and look at the undulations and look at the off diagonal peaks that grow in and look at how the energy transfers through the system. And in particular, the coherences which manifest in these spectra as different sort of motions uh, and oscillations. And if we pick one point on the spectrum, we can reproduce these. So I had different students go into the lab with different samples, different positions of the motion control stages to make sure it wasn't wobble. Um, on different days with different laser alignments, slightly different spectra. And we retook this data over and over again. And it's really amazing. It, it agrees in both phase and frequency day after day. Now, uh, my students did you know, cut off some runs a little bit early uh, here, but you, know, you can see that this data is reproducible, which is exciting. It's, you know, this is not noise, this is signal. Now, what it means is open to a lot of interpretation and this is where things get hairy. And there's no way because of the perturbation theory in these 2D spectra to tell if you've gone up twice to an excited state or if you've gone up and down and you're back on a ground state. There's no a priori way to say from these spectra. So you have to try very hard to pull that out. And we did as did many other groups, but ultimately what this demands is a new experiment um, that you can tell a lot of stories about this, but you wanna know what's really right. You have to do some sort of new uh, experiment to understand what's going on. And so, quickly, quickly, we, like the beautiful, beautiful stuff uh, in the previous slide. Um, if you were to Fourier transform them, um, uh, do they emerge in the same uh, power spec in the sense power spectrum that you get from the essentially the Raman uh, frequencies? Yeah. So what we see, what we see is uh, if we look at the different, uh, if we look at the different peaks we tend to see dominant features that relate to the energy gaps, say the difference between this energy and this energy. Okay. Here, we're actually pulling in, there are two features. There's one here and there's one here. And if we scan across it, we see something more like a sinusoid on the left, more like a sinusoid on the right. And here you actually see interference where it goes away and looks like it comes back. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just interference between two sine waves. And so we, we do tend to see that. Um, if we analyze the power spectrum, you do get patterns and you expect slightly different patterns from uh, situations where you have a vibrational or vibronic uh, situation. Jennifer Ogilvy has published uh, quite a bit on what these patterns look like. Um, and yet it's still not quite conclusive. If, if we could really resolve better, I think things would be good, but there's seven states and it's really tough to tell what's what. Um, so we had a lot of trouble trying to fit with these patterns as did others who looked at our data as well as their own. 
And I should say other people do see these signals uh, as well. The reason for the amplitude is not defacing at all. The amplitudes of the oscillations from 400 or onwards, 500 times per second to 1,000, there are three really prominent oscillations in their data. Yeah. Um, I'm, if I skip ahead a slide, they do actually decay as you start to raise the temperature. Okay. Okay. And you can, you can force that decay, and you're right. That the defasing time, you know, we, we would have predicted from the uh, anti-diagonal line shape here, the homogeneous width should have said it would be gone at 77 Kelvin by about 100 femtoseconds, and it clearly is not. And it would be about 10 femtoseconds, 15 femtoseconds at 277 Kelvin, and we still see oscillations out far beyond uh, 10 femtoseconds. So there is a decay envelope, absolutely, it's there. Um, and you know, maybe it's more clear here when I subtract the exponential uh, and I actually plot the dephasing rates uh, right. down at the bottom. And you, you can see that it is there. Um, th there's no question. Okay. But uh, yeah, this, this is unusual. This is also not the pattern you typically expect for a vibration uh, either, which right. is also a little bit complex because of the temperature dependence. Thank you. Um, but they're also not nice harmonic vibrations inside a protein. So <laughs> it, right. You know, none of this is conclusive, and this is one of the things that really drove us to try and answer or use the spectroscopy to answer this question of where are these coming from? Because, you know, in some sense, the only way you might get this, if it's electronic, would be if those states are moving in sync. And that's not something that we would really expect, at least naively, inside a protein. And, you know, so this demands a measurement where you can measure spectral motion. Um, that, that's really what has to happen. Yeah. Tell us, and I'll show you that measurement. Oh, nice. um, so why is there so much controversy? Well, I think I probably covered this. I mean, uh, you know, there are beautiful papers arguing that it's right or it's not, or it's vibrational, um, or you know, it's something very complex, avoided conical intersections where there is indeed an excited state coupling to a different vibration you don't see, and these ones you do see are spectators. They may be on the ground state or excited state, or real vibronic coupling. Uh, Kristen Cinnamon Saul. Uh, argue for this model. And there have been many, many other papers. These are some of the earlier uh, ones. Uh, Alexandra Alea Castro has written on this extensively with some great insights as well. Um, there are many, many papers looking at these questions. And our approach, I think everything I cite here is a theory paper. Our approach is, as experimentalists, is to try to make the right measurement. Uh, and that's really where, where we go. So we ask ourselves first, what's relevant and what's not? And, even if you didn't hang with the last little bit of spectroscopy, let me try again to explain what's going on. So if you have an excitation, say in the blue, and it's going to move over to the green, a slightly lower energy gap. So you move from high energy to a low energy gap. Well, if the states move randomly, they will occasionally come into sync. And this would be Forster transfer, where you just get this random resonance energy transfer. And so if the states move randomly, fret, Forster energy transfer will work. And this is very, very common in the chemical uh, realm. Now, another way to think about it is what if those states mix and delocalize? And now suddenly a bath fluctuation as compared to a second order perturbation in the electro electric coupling, uh, that's going to cause the contributions of these two states to change. And that's actually going to drive energy transfer from the high state to the low state. This would be Redfield uh, transfer. And then you can get some of the more wild explanations of what happens if they move together. And these are all those dynamics I just showed you are all relevant to what happens to the fate of the bright excited state after excitation. There is of course the possibility that you just see ground state vibrational motion, which absent an unusual coupling doesn't really tell you much about the excited states. I've in fact removed them from the picture. So what are we seeing? Well, you know, we know what we're seeing. It's a we're seeing a coherence between a superposition of two quantum states. What we're really asking is what are the nature of those two quantum states? Are they going to be electronic coherence in the excited state? Are they going to be vibrational coherences either on the excited or the ground state? Are they going to be vibronic coherences because there's been mixing between electronic states and vibrational states where the two come into resonance? And which of these can be relevant then for the dynamics? And how can we suss this out? And I will argue pretty much anything on the top of the screen gets really interesting really fast. And the vibrational coherences at the bottom require very specific and kind of tortured models for those to report on uh, excited state dynamics. There are examples of that. That's actually the only one I know of is from Vivek. 
And I mean, it's a correct model. It's, it's real. It can happen. It's, I don't know if it is happening, but uh, that's the only one where you can make the argument that ground state vibration is relevant. Otherwise, they're, they're really not. Um, I'm going to argue that we are seeing something more like the coherent motion. And you know, we thought a lot of ways to approach this. So we tried to run away from biology. You know, can we just create a chemical system that will do this? And we created a series of small molecules where we created heterodimers that were quite stiff and we saw some of these signals, but not optimized. Um, and that's probably because we're using laser dyes that were designed to absorb at one frequency and emitted another. So large reorganizational energies compared to chlorophyll. And then we created ones that were floppy. And they show none of this dynamic until you plate them on a carbon nanotube and they stiffen. And then you see this come right back. So we can really tell that geometric relationships are key to this type of uh, spectroscopy. And that's also a reason why I think we see this in photosynthetic complexes where those relationships are enforced by the protein, but typically not in any other chemical systems, uh, except you know, these couple examples. You know, we also tried to figure out how to see, uh, use our data sets to see new things. And so this is actually the very first measurement of spectral diffusion. This is not the one that got published in chem. This is an early version of it where we just got the hint that, wow, there's something neat happening. And we could actually follow the spectral motion of each of these states. And what we found was the mean moved, which is a deterministic motion out of the Frank Condon region. And of course there's spectral diffusion as it widens. And you can see this plotted here for the first six excitons. And I think you'll find it striking that that motion isn't random. That, that, that those six curves look awfully similar. And so what's neat about this particular experiment, not only does it use data like what we already have, but it plots during a very different time period. It looks just at this very first time period where you ne necessarily have a ground and excited state. Up here, what I was showing you before could be an excited state or a ground state. You could go up and back down or go up twice. Here, there's only one interaction. So you know you're seeing a ground excited state coherence. And that allows you to watch this and watch what the excited state does. And we found this really cool. So we went and we ran that experiment much more carefully. And we found that for all seven excitons, we see very similar curves that have a high degree of correlation all the way out to a picosecond. That is those Frank Condon motions that destroy the overlap between an excited state wave packet and a ground state wave packet. Don't destroy overlap between excited state wave packets because it's deterministic motion in all of these cases. Now, if we put in something different like Nile blue, we see a very different path, which is to be expected. It's a completely different molecule under completely different circumstances. Um, the other thing that's kind of neat, if you take the Fourier transform of this, it matches the fluorescence line narrowing spectra, which are related to the excited state vibrational motion. So someone was asking about excited state Raman. This has a lot of that information in it. It's not excited state Raman, but it has uh, similar information content. And so we found this really interesting. What the first thing it told us was if you excite exciton one and exciton three within about 40 or 50 femtoseconds of each other, which is what we were doing in those initial experiments, they are going to move in very self-similar fashion. Uh, and the dephasing from the change in width is going to be minor. Um, this is all 77 Kelvin data. And this explains a lot of that slow dephasing we were seeing. Um, it's deterministic motion. And then Ignacio Franco went and started to explain, well, let me tell you one other thing. There's also sympathetic motion, um, which tells you that unoccupied states move. It's like the airplane example where the unoccupied seat is moving alongside the occupied one. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but I do wanna give you a sort of a chemical explanation of what's happening. And that is when you lift that wave packet up to the excited state due to a little bit of anharmonicity, um, just inherent in these molecules from the pi to pi star transition, you do see a, a, an evolution on the excited state surface because the shape is a little different than the ground state surface. But all of those excited state surfaces are very much self-similar. So this is an idea from Ignacio Franco uh, that I think actually he worked on when uh, with Paul Brumer uh, a long time ago. And uh, he's been publishing on this quite a bit. There's, there's something really neat about this because all the excited states are self-similar the motion between the excited states doesn't destroy the overlap between these nuclear wave packets, which is a measure of that dephasing, but it does change the overlap between the excited and the ground state. And this explains a lot of what can be going on. Those excited states are similar. The ground state looks somewhat different. And so anharmonicity destroys overlap with the ground state, but not with the excited state. Uh, they evolve in a very similar fashion. So 
this is, I think, what's going on. And I think the right picture is that a lot of the relevant motions on the time scale in that picosecond after uh, absorbing a photon are going to be uh, driven by that Frank Con moving out of that Frank Condon region. So from a microscopic chemical perspective, that's the way to think about this. OK. Um, Greg? At, yes. Uh, just a question. How are the distances between these molecules? So on the order of about 12 angstroms. So if, and, and they're not small mm -hmm. molecules. So they're, they're packed in fairly close. So coupling between say one and uh, seven or two and five, any sort of uh, coupling is possible in any of these molecules? Um, so the couplings between them go up to a few hundred wave numbers for the electronic okay. couplings between the molecules. Okay. Now they range, they range from like 0.3 to a few hundred. So, I mean, they're in certain cases, just by geometry, you get something that's almost zero because it's a vector coupling. You also have a spatial component to that as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we also tried to look at dynamic localization and how quickly these things localize. We created some chiral spectroscopies and there are a lot of tricks that you can play with polarization and whatnot in these two-dimensional measurements. So this is the first 2D chiral spectroscopy. Um, and then the other thing that we wanted to do is just go into living cells and run these same 2D spectra, not on pristine isolated protein complexes, but actually look at them inside live cells. And so we and managed to eliminate all of the scatter. And if you're an ultra-fast spectroscopist, you can imagine trying to go through the sludge that is a growth medium. There are actually some cool tricks with 2D spectroscopy to do that. And this is a publication from one of my students uh, looking at Rhodobacter spheroides. And you see all these coherences actually in the living system, which is very neat uh, as well. Now, I should also be clear that you know, the coherences are created by the lasers, but the environment that we're probing, uh, as our biochemistry colleagues told us, was really quite similar to what you see inside the membranes to the point where you see these same dephasing dynamics uh, inside the living organisms, which were what pretty are exciting. Exciting to you were pretty excited. What were you excited? In the systems, where are you? Excuse parking me. The laser. Where are you parking the laser? What are you exciting? It, so th this is uh, basically LH two reaction center in LH one in Rhodobacter spheroides, a purple bacteria. So it's at eight hundred nanometers, say seven seven fifty to eight fifty. We were using white light from an argon tube to do this one. Right. So 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 you basically uh, so so you you think most of it is being because the oscillator strength of these uh, light harvesting complexes are so large as compared to anything else that is present in the... Well, they, they, they make lots and lots of copies of these. So if you look at the membrane from Rhodobacter spheroides, it is basically a close packed hexagonal lattice with the yeah. occasional disruption from something else, but it is mostly light harvesting antenna complexes. Fantastic, okay. Yeah, so they, they, they produce enormous amounts of these complexes. And you don't absolutely purify, you just have the cells in there. This is, this is just the cell in its native growth medium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it looks like sludge. <laughs> cool. Okay. And the scatter is enormous. But know, I, would, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the scatter is hundreds of times larger than the signal. Right. Cool. Okay. But we can eliminate the scatter in the various Fourier domains. <laughs> And we can be left with a signal where we get about 90% of the same signal noise as if we had uh, well, my in vitro the, expert. Yeah, it's it's it separates out in the Fourier domain. So that scatter, as long as you have the dynamic range on your detector, the scatter doesn't affect your sensitivity. Okay. Cool. It took us a while to figure that out. I will admit that that's you know that's Pete Dolberg, uh, who's now a postdoc at Stanford, who came up with that idea and is absolutely brilliant. Um, that it takes very minimal signal processing. It's just that we had never tried the spectroscopy on that because it seemed like a terrible idea. Okay. Um, works beautifully. Okay. Um, so there are a lot of questions that are still outstanding. I mean, one of the big ones, and I think the first one that anyone asked, does biology actually use these mechanisms? Or are they just byproducts of the fact that biology is built out of molecules and atoms? I mean, are we just looking at vibrations in chlorophyll? Is, is this actually important? Is there a way to tell if these types of coincidences between electronic energy gaps and a vibration are actually important to the function of the complex in its native environment. That is, does biology exploit this? Or does it just happen to be there because we built a very nice spectrometer and we're looking at atoms and molecules? Molecules. Um, 
inside these biological systems. And then the other question is, what can these coherences really teach us? So, you know, something that Paul Brumer taught us right away and forcefully was the, these coherences don't happen in nature. These are created by your laser, which is absolutely true. They synchronize the entire ensemble so we can see a macroscopic uh, effect, which is what a coherence is. It's a macroscopic effect across an ensemble. That would never happen in nature. But the underlying Hamiltonian, that which could create branching ratios in a steady state transformation, or that which dictates a detailed motions in a trajectory in an MD simulation, that underlying Hamiltonian that you're probing, the system bath Hamiltonian, which is key to driving the relaxation, is the same whether you use coherent light or incoherent light. Your field-free evolution is going to be determined by that Hamiltonian. And that's really what we're watching here. We're watching the nature of those motions across the ensemble, which of those are synchronized with the excitation, which are not, which are phase sensitive, which are not. And it tells you about the microscopic mechanisms. And so this quickly becomes a tool for probing the very fine nature of those bath fluctuations that we're otherwise blind to in our spectroscopy as we look at these types of motions inside our 2D spectra, but we can't see them directly. And so, you know, the, these are two questions that we want to talk about. Now I'll answer the top one for you tomorrow. Um, and actually the press releases came out today. Uh, so if you want to scoop the talk tomorrow, you can go search Physorg and whatnot. But uh, we can see that biology does do this. And I'll show you where that data comes from um, tomorrow during the talk. And with that, I want to acknowledge my group. I mean, these are the people who drive this science. These are the people who make it work. They're the ones who are down in the lab. Um, it's, it's them with their hands on the knobs, not me. Uh, and they're the ones who uh, put in the blood, sweat, and tears to make things actually happen. Uh, and then Bob Blankenship and his group, uh, particularly Raphael Sayer, for helping provide many of the samples for the talks, for the uh, data that I showed you today. And of course, our funding sources uh, for giving us the ability to do this. And I thank all of you for the invitation and your attention. I'm happy to take questions. And if you're ever in Chicago, if air travel opens back up, you know, we're about five miles south of the city here. And you know, please feel free to stop in uh, and visit us in the lab. We have an open door policy, except during COVID. Um, and we're always happy to give tours and show people around and show people what we do um, at the moment, uh, as I'm sure you appreciate things are a little bit more stuck. Um, but uh, we're, we're sitting actually under eight feet underground right under this quad right here. Uh, and that's where our labs are, a nice vibrationally quiet uh, space. Um, so if you come down to campus, please come join us. And thank you for your attention. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you for doing this in the first uh, tutorial series. So I will uh, now um, invite uh, uh, all participants to ask yeah. questions. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask directly fire the questions. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Uh, yeah, yes. yes. Uh, so, again, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, just a quick question about, uh, you know, the one of the later slides where you showed correlated fluctuations between different excitons in a thermal complex. Uh, so, I guess the first question is, have you tried it on, let's say, a uh, rotovector variety system? And the reason the, I... No, we, we have not. We have not yet. But that is an experiment that we would like to run. Yes. yes. And the, I guess the reason I was asking is, uh, there are these... Um, results from uh, Van Hul's group, like from Richard Hildner and uh, Nick Van Hul's about, you know, single, single complex studies, where uh, I guess, you know, some of these correlated fluctuations uh, or let's say the coherences between excited states uh, wouldn't dephase as fast. And I think you can relate those to the, uh, you know, time scales of these correlated fluctuations. And I, I guess their study was on LH2 complex. So, yeah. yeah. No, I, th I think it's a very, I think it's a very good point. And I think it's a very good, uh, a very good question. We, we need to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, yes Professor Bhatt. Yes. Good morning, Greg. Hello. How are you? Fine. Nice to good see to you. Good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. And I, 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 couple of questions. The first one, when we did our, these calculations on these two level systems. Uh, we always thought this issue of the coherence, you know, in this system, coherence are uh, created by the static of diagonal coupling, as you know very well. 
and uh, these uh, fluctuations do all kinds of things. Also, like the helium uh, issue, when you put this in a uh, cold heat, then the coherence becomes probably more dominant and decay can become faster. Now, uh, so the issue of Paul Bromer that in real world, there is no coherence is probably not too relevant uh, in my mind because you have this system, as you and Graham says, that you have this system Hamiltonian and you are probing the system Hamiltonian with lots of off-diagonal couplings, which are quite dominant, static off-diagonal coupling. That's very important. They, they are driving the coherence and they are the players in this game. They are the players who are moving energy around. Uh, so Paul Brumer's comment that in the real world you have incoherent light, uh, that is probably, my understanding, in the very short time. Of course, how short is very short. Uh, so when you, you don't need to create the coherence. My thing is that if there is a system Hamiltonian with a strong off diagonal coupling, you already have those coherence sitting there for you. Yeah, so Paul's argument, I mean, so for those of you who know me well and see me argue with Paul at ACS meetings, which we do, we, we enjoy arguing. So I will now have the honor of taking Paul's side in the argument and just go back and forth because I don't disagree with you. But what Paul is a very formal theorist and his comment is incoherent excitation will never lead to ensemble wide coherences appearing because it would require synchronization of that excitation. And so what you're saying is, is true. Those off diagonal elements, if you start at time zero with an excitation, you will see coherences appear from those yeah, elements. Yeah. There's a fast thing but we learned in 1980s. If you take an ensemble of those all excited at different times, mm -hmm. there will be no phase relationship across the ensemble. And so Paul, Paul, I've learned from arguing with Paul for many years that Paul is almost never wrong. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't teach you something. I think exactly what you said is correct, that you learn about the microscopic nature from these synchronized excitations, and you learn about the Hamiltonian, and you learn about these coherences that can be created, and it's see, absolutely relevant. And yeah. Paul does see this in his, his simulations. He sees it as a branching ratio because he does infinite time, non-equilibrium steady state calculations. And so he sees the branching ratio change but he has no sense of mechanism in a chemical sense, which is exactly what you're getting at. I mean, mm -hmm. you're getting at what is absolutely crucial to chemical mechanism. And we, we, we need, see, even doing any simple level calculation, we need these off diagonal couplings, which I think you and Graham Fleming, that table we used. Uh, I think if those couplings are there in nature and those couplings are carrying the energy around, right? Absolutely. And that, that's exactly right. And all you need is a fast excitation to be able to see it. And I have a last, second question and a very silly question. Uh, see, in my, you know, I, I always bump into this like Leventhal paradox. Uh, the talk of evolution, we just started these beautiful slides that you have showed in the, in the beginning, this proof and the, the, the billion years evolution. But we always think that when you look into molecular level and we impose, that evolution uh, in, 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 in our uh, uh, genome, in protein synthesis, everywhere we say, okay, uh, the fittest survive and Darwin's theory. But has anybody, you know, this is more of a question of uh, a curious mind. Has anybody looked into the different time scales from say synthesis of protein or even lower level uh, mutation uh, where things can go wrong. Uh, all the way, how long then if a wrong mutation, then that protein will die, uh, get out of the system. And then how do we build up to a machine, to a motor protein? Has anybody worked out certain time scales of the time that you are saying here? That means the uh, corresponding uh, biomolecular uh, Theory of evolution, like living thought paradox, gives you time. Has anybody done that? So, I mean, I, I, there's very little conclusive work on evolution and evolution pathways in that regard. Um, 
what I meant to say in the beginning with this introduction is that this is a process under great evolutionary pressure, and therefore it's a logical place to look for finely tuned mechanism. I can't say much about the history, but what I will show you tomorrow is that two point mutations and two separate cysteine residues can mm -hmm. completely break the vibronic coupling that I just described to you today. So now I don't have a time scale for how often in these particular organisms there is a given point mutation in one of mm -hmm. these, but I can tell you that those cysteines are conserved across all the clades of green sulfur bacteria. And mm -hmm. it turns out they're absolutely necessary for photoprotection in an oxi oxidative environment. Um, so I won't give away too much of the punchline for tomorrow, but it mm -hmm. turns out that single point mutations are enough to affect this measurement. And the particular ones that are important are conserved across vast swaths of these green sulfur bacteria. <clears throat> and because they've been around for so long, there really is a lot of divergence uh, in the clades. So this, mm -hmm. is, this is some evidence that speaks to your question of getting at this mm -hmm. history and evolutionary pressure, but it's not definitive. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Jay Shri, you raise the hand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so I, I was just wondering about, uh, you know, uh, you know, generally the mechanism of the energy transfer. Uh, so could you sort of comment on, uh, uh, you know, how reliably and if, if so, uh, can you measure these site energy? So, you know, you were talking about the regime where, you know, you have weak coupling, but at the same time, you know, you're sort of you know, you're always looking at the eigenstate basis, but then, you know, when you have very weak coupling, could you be also looking at the site basis in some limit? And so, so can you actually comment on the site energy sort of measurements? Yeah, so we, we have tried many times to invert this. I mean, you, if you have a coupling model and you have the excitonic energies, at least nominally, you can invert to get your site energies. And we tried to do this in various ways over the years with different degrees of success, I should say. Um, and, but we don't have a direct measurement of the site energies. We do have a lot of modeling where people have, others have looked at this carefully. And I think the very best measurements of this sort have been done by Rizard uh, Jankowiak at Kansas State using hole burning measurements and effectively burning individual chromophores and then trying to uh, piece together the Hamiltonian. And so Adam Kell has a paper, I believe in 2016 uh, with Rizard and Bob Blankenship um, if you send me an email, I'll send you the reference uh, sure. so I get it Perfect. exactly yeah. right. But yeah. Kel is the first, it's Kel, Blankenship, and Jankowiak, uh, 2016, I think JCP. Um, they have a very nice model, which they term Model C, that gets these things, I think, very close to right. It has a very good spectral density from their hole burning, and I believe it has uh, some of the best site energies that you'll yeah, find. Because, uh, you know, it, it would seem like if, if you're indeed sort of close to looking at site energies and you could sort of literally follow the mechanism by, you know, how the energy is transferred from one site to another. Right. So, you know, it, in some sense, this has been a problem for the photosynthetic community for a long time that if you if you really have weak electronic coupling, so you're really in the site energy basis, you, you can think about pointer states that look like the sites. And if you are uh, in the opposite regime, the red field, so that's Forrester effectively. In the opposite regime, the red field regime where you have you can be exact in your uh, electronic couplings, but you have to be mm -hmm. second order in your system bath couplings. Right. Um, that gives you a very different sort of picture. Bob Silby, uh, I think around 2012, 2011, published on these pictures extensively. They're both second order perturbation uh, mm -hmm. approaches. And it turns out that we're in the intermediate regime where you need Tanamura's hierarchical mm -hmm. equations of motion to really think about doing this right. Um, and people had tried modified red field theory and other kludges, mm -hmm. but uh, Akihito Ishizaki and uh, Yosutaka Tanamura, I think, really solved this with the hierarchical equation of motion. And there have been a couple of other DMRG uh, approaches out of Plenio's group, among others, that tackle the problem from a different angle. But I think you need those more exact treatments that I think yeah. any yeah. somewhat simplistic perturbation theory treatments fail because you're in this intermediate regime where the system yeah. bath coupling so is roughly the same yeah. as the electronic coupling which leads mm -hmm. you exactly to this pointer state conundrum that is, comes up in other areas of quantum. Yeah, yeah, I understand, yeah, thank yeah. you. That's Ravi Kishore, uh, he raised the hand. Can you please unmute, yeah, please go ahead. Hi, Greg, very nice talk. Well, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First thing is, uh, I have this dynamic uh, inhomogeneous broadening versus static inhomogeneous broadening. 
can you differentiate both of this in your um, system so you know inhomogeneous broadening is the long time limit of a correlation function but homogeneous broadening is a short time limit the beautiful part about ultrafast spectroscopy is you actually plot all the points in between so we can watch as a inhomogeneously broadened peak turns into a homogeneously broadened peak provided it happens faster than the time scale of relaxation um, so we can look at this and we can see uh, what you might call static inhomogeneity, that is the correlation function at value infinity versus you know, plotting it out from zero to a couple of picoseconds. Now we do have trouble where in our experiments, a few picoseconds is equivalent to us as infinity. And I understand that that will bother some modelers, but we can follow it as long as we have signal. Um, okay. And we can plot out that correlation function where we consider you know, time t equals zero, zero femtoseconds to be that you know, homogeneous limit where nothing goes faster than our pulses. When we have 10 or 15 femtosecond pulses, it's really quite limiting. And then the uh, follow-up is we go out as long as we can possibly go and we still don't see it. There are beautiful uh, three PEPs experiments from the Fleming group in the late nineties uh, that show for chromophores in a protein environment, all of these different time scales and the fact that as best they can measure, which with a lock-in amplifier is longer than I can measure with my experiments, they see what I would call permanent inhomogeneity on the time scales of these ultrafast measurements, which is protein conformation. They're slow compared to femtoseconds. Okay, cool. Yeah. One more question. Uh, uh, Greg, uh, this, uh, uh, just a continuation of uh, what Jayesh has asked. Uh, looking at the mechanism of energy transfer, uh, is there a chance of, uh, because the distances are quite close, is there a chance of Dexter mechanism of energy transfer? Uh, uh, did you say Dexter energy transfer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, so people have looked at that and in these photosynthetic complexes, the Dexter energy transfer has not been relevant. Um, so people have looked at that pretty closely and we have not seen strong enough coupling for that mechanism to show up. Okay, okay. thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, Greg. Um, I know time is running out. I'll just take a couple of a, a couple of qu questions from the YouTube. Um, so there is a question by Atanu uh, who has typed in um, in YouTube. How did you assign the coherence as electronic coherence? Uh, how do we physically understand and differentiate it between electronic and vibronic? Yeah. No. This this is a fantastic and sophisticated question. So let me answer it quite honestly that when we did this in 2007, we assigned it to electronic coherence, but it was somewhat naive that, that we, we can't separate this cleanly. And this is something that we weren't aware of. So I, what we said in that first nature paper is that it's fully consistent with electronic coherence, which is a step short of saying that it is. Um, and, but that was our working assignment and we should be very honest about that. Uh, it was pointed out later that, you know, there are elements of the spectroscopy that could allow you to mistake a ground state vibrational coherence for this. And now going back and looking at the spectral diffusion, I think we see a system that's consistent with the electronic coherence, but our experiments don't tell us the nature of the states. They only tell us the frequencies and the energies. That's what we get out of spectroscopy. So it is always speculative assignments when we try to do that. And I think, you know, we, we need to come up with more insightful experiments and we need to come up with better models, but in particular, the experiments can help with this. Okay, cool. And the second question from YouTube is, um, from the Fourier transform, the coherent oscillations, can we predict reaction coordinates that drive the process? Yeah, so, so this, this is something that I have wondered as well. And there are papers, I, again, we'll point to uh, Tuari and Jonas's PNS paper circa 2012, I may have the year wrong, um, looking at these mechanisms. And there they do actually come up with a very nice mechanism for an anti-symmetric, at least in a uh, two chromophore system, motion that can drive uh, effectively a reaction coordinate in the system. And you know, so there are some papers that are, and that's a really solid model that show that you can use these in some cases to define a reaction coordinate. But inside the protein, we have not been able to do that. Okay. We do have some hints in the data I'll show you tomorrow that we kind of know what's going on and we see other vibrations that are not the one that's driving this, which is consistent with the uh, Tuari and Jonas uh, hypothesis. Right, and Greg, I have a request before uh, Vivek Tiwari asks the final question and then Satish concludes it. 
Um, uh, I, I have a request if, if the next talk, the first at least five minutes, you could just go through the, the Feynman diagram picture for explaining the perturbation just a little bit, just a little bit of a, yeah, sure. a review. That would help the students because uh, this is completely new to them. So that no, I, I am happy. I'm happy to do that in detail. I didn't want to dwell on it too much here. Yeah, because, yeah, uh, I, know, I know. But maybe I haven't maybe read Mukamel's book. Uh, that will be yeah, a yeah, loss, yeah. but I'm happy to do that tomorrow. We can just for a short bit. Look at definition. Yeah. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Vivek. Vivek, please. Last question. Yeah, sorry, one more question. Uh, so, Greg, since you mentioned the hierarchical equations of motion from uh, Ishizaki, uh, uh, I guess my question would, I think the when their J. Kempfer's 2014 or 2015 paper came out, it was around the same time when the correlated exciton fluctuations uh, paper came out from your group, uh, probably. So, I guess my question is, uh, you know, have they thought about, uh, I guess, refining their model based on uh, the results from this. Yeah. This, is, this is another, I think, very insightful question, and we have not really. Um, this, is, this is something that we, we would be happy to see people do and use. Um, I, and I don't know that there's more data we would take to support that effort, but I would love to see people do that. I would love to see elements of this deterministic motion out of a Frank Condon region be folded into that so that you have both thermal and non-thermal, that is non-equilibrium motions involved in that model. And the model should be able to handle that. The way, the way it's constructed should be able to handle that if you move certain modes into the system. There has been some discussion of how you handle the phasing of those modes as compared to the ohmic and superohmic spectral densities that you require to have the appropriate terminator for the hierarchical equation of motion. This is where some of the DMRG theories may actually have an advantage because they don't require the very specific uh, spectral densities that are required to get the proper termination of the hierarchical equations. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I think we are already five to seven minutes late. Okay, great. Thank you very much for walking us through very, very basics of 2D spectroscopy. And you know, talking about coherences, this is a very complex topic. I think uh, your insightful explanation will certainly help our students, faculty, and we are looking forward for tomorrow's lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. We'll sign off and we'll sign off. Bye. And good night. Good night. <laughs> Have a sound sleep. Thank, thank Have you. Sleep. Take, take Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. See you tomorrow. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Bachi. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Anshu. Bye. 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 See you tomorrow. You tomorrow. Some of your students joined in. I'm very happy to see them. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, qu quite a number were in the audience. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, hello to Caitlin and uh, Indranil and Sid, if he's still here. Right. Sid is here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>